Okay, thank you. We're going to call this meeting to order at 10.05. So, okay, let's, let's go. My uh, idea this morning is to try to move as quickly as we can. So um, let's see whether I can do that or not. Anyway, welcome. This is the 62nd meeting of the NISPAC. Um, this is a public meeting. It is also audio recorded. We're also using WebEx as we did uh, last time. We have a large number of presenters this morning, so again, we're going to try to move this along. Um, at the end of each presentation, we'll have a small question and answer session. Um, microphones for the uh, NISPAC members on the first two rows, and then for the rest of you all, they're at the end of each, uh, each aisle. After the questions are taken internally here, we will turn to the WebEx and ask whether or not there are any questions that way, and then we'll also turn to the uh, telephone. So again, we'll try to get everybody included and not leave uh, anybody out. The only caveat in all that is when you do speak, please, please identify yourselves. As you know, we are required to produce minutes of this meeting, and it is a lot easier when we're doing that to say, okay, X is, is from here, Y was that, instead of us trying to figure out who is actually speaking, sometimes, right? Sometimes we're not. We'll have a 10-minute break uh, about halfway through, and uh, I'll give you more details on where the restrooms are and, and cafeteria and all that once we... Uh... All right, let's get to it. Uh, introduce ourselves here at the table. I am uh, Mark A. Bradley, the director of ISU and the uh, chair of the NISPAC. Uh, Greg Pannoni, Associate Director, ISU, and the DFO for this meeting. I'm Jeff Spinager from the Department of Defense. Natasha Rice, Department of Energy. Daryl Parsons, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. District. Valerie Kirvin, O. Quentin Wilkes, Industry, and his back spokesperson. All right, just back members in the first uh, two rows, please. Identify yourselves. Scott, Department of Homeland Security. Kim Bogger, State Department. Karen Domlinger, Air Force. Chris Forrest, DCSA. Heather Martiga, DCSA. Zadaya Taylor Dunn, NASA. Fred Gortler, DCSA. Crystal Fulton, DHS. Charleston, NISPAC, Industry. Kimberly Tiger, National Security Agency. David Wright, DOD CAF. Patricia Stokes, DCSA. Terry Carpenter, Defense Information Systems Agency. Chuck Barber, DCSA. Dennis Key, NISPAC, Industry. All right, Dennis, that's it. We're just, we're just doing the NISPAC, the NISPAC yeah. members in the interest of time. Interest of time. Otherwise, we'd be here for quite a while. Um, all right. Um, are there any NISPAC members on the uh, telephone? NISPAC members on the WebEx? First and foremost, uh, as we start the meeting, I'd like to thank uh, Quentin Wilkes for your service. This is your last uh, one of these. You've Well, he's been a gentleman and a uh, scholar and a passionate advocate for, uh, for industry. Anyway, was it? Out of the box. We want to thank Katie Simmons for coordinating all this. Yeah. Is he uh, somewhere? Black says, Quentin Wilkes, thank you for your time. Late nights, no kidding, moderation, cat wrangling, that crew, travel, dedication, support. As an industry NISPAC spokesperson, we couldn't have done it without you. 20. I'd also like to thank Dennis Keith. Dennis, this is your last one, too. I'll never. Never uh, forget you're one of the first people I met in this, and your southern charm uh, always in, in, always in, in, in presence. And uh, anyway, you, you, you two have done great service to this organization. And 
It's totally missed. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> Lastly, we understand that the membership of Fred Gortler of DSS, now DCSA, has expired. Uh, we understand there have been many changes in the agency. We hope to have a new member very soon. Fred replacement. Anyway, it's going to be big, big shoes to fill. He's been another great asset to this uh, to this body. All right, let's get in, into the meat of the meeting. I'm going to turn to Greg. You're going to address some administrative items and also cover some status from our last uh, Ms. Back in yep. March. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, as usual, the uh, the meeting presentations handouts were electronically sent to all the members and anyone who RSVP'd on the invitation. And so for those of you attending that didn't receive those, you can look for that on our website uh, along with the file. This meeting in about 30 days and the handouts, as well as an official transcript of, of this. Um, so I'm going to move right into the action items uh, from our last meeting. Um, as you know, not much has happened since our last meeting. Not true. <laughs> it's actually been a great deal going on. I'm sure all of you would have. So we had, we had nine items from the last meeting, and uh, I'm going to read them off. And the first one we're, we're going to do right now, and that is for DOD, I'm going to ask Valerie Howe to provide an update on the status of NISPOM change three, particularly for the, C, the C3 matter. Uh, clearance working group. We continue to uh, work on uh, the companion guidance that would go out with the NISPOM Change 3 in an industrial security letter. There are some areas that we are working on in discussion with ODNI, um, drug investment uh, related uh, investments that have come up. We will keep you apprised, and as we always do, DOD will request NISPAC informal feedback on any draft industrial security letter about NISPOM Change 3 when we have it ready. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. Moving on. Um, we had an item for ODNI to hold a meeting, um, and the date we had was March 28th to discuss industry inclusion in Trusted Workforce 2.0. Uh, the meeting did occur. Uh, we will hear a little bit more about that in an update by Valerie Kerbin from ODNI during her. So I'll, I'll pause on that. Uh, next was industry requested to have a meeting to discuss DSS and transition. Same thing, we're gonna, we're gonna pause on that. Quentin Wilkes industry will address that during the industry update. Uh, next was industry to provide ISU instances of delayed mid process by CSA slash CSO. So uh, ISU did receive metric data data uh, from industry this morning. Uh, we will, ISU will convene a NISPAC NID working group meeting in the very near future with industry, CSAs, and DCSA to address the challenges uh, in the NID process. So we've got that for action. Uh, next, uh, DC, uh, DCSA is, uh, this is the one that concerns the insider threat, ISL, industrial security letter, that's working its way through. My understanding is uh, industry is consolidating all of their comments and expects to have them to DCSA shortly. By is the date we're referring to. Okay, next um, is the uh, CUI was going to host uh, a stakeholders meeting on April 17th as well as an industry day on the 21st. These meetings were held. There are slides posted for the stakeholders meeting on the CUI blog, which you can find on the CUI webpage. Next, CUI was to inform when the NIST, NIST SP800171 Rev 2 will be available for public comment. Uh, in the summer, more information was going to be on the blog. So there is a blog posting on that. Uh, comment period for the 171 Rev 2 as well as the 171B, and actually the comment period closes tomorrow, July. This has been extended to what's that date? August 2nd. Okay, so update on that. August 2nd is an extension for the comment period on that. So um, thank you. Uh, 
Next, DCSA offered to meet with Department of State about access to DISS. Um, Ms. Stokes from DCSA will provide an update on this uh, during her update it's later in the meeting. And then we have one more, and that was also Ms. Stokes accepted an action item for the Enterprise Business Support Office to hold a stakeholders group meeting. And uh, Ms. Stokes, with Doc, along with Dr. Barber, will provide an update on this item a little later. In the so are there any questions? Good morning. Um, yeah, pretty pretty packed agenda, so I'll try to, to uh, keep my remarks very brief. Um, I'd like to start out um, by again echoing uh, the commentary regarding all of the uh, the ISLs that are out there and the com continued commitment from uh, NISPAC industry for the candor feedback that comes in. Um, that can make products better, uh, so please keep that going. Uh, Quentin and Dennis, uh, their departure, frankly, their mentorship on many of these issues, um, I'll call it active. Um, but the, that, that, that's essential to the process. So whoever's coming in on the back side of it, um, I hope you follow their example because I, you know, thank you very much for that. Uh, the other, uh, just the two biggest updates that I wanted to, to focus in on, right, so last time uh, NIDS came up, right, I can't not have a meeting or go 15 minutes without saying NID. And so um, Section 842 uh, is a, it was the attention getter last time. It continues to be and will continue to be. Um, but I think we have a, a pretty good update, and we'll, we'll look to delve, delve into this much deeper at the, at the working groups. So we're, we're happy to see that those will, um, uh, you know, reinvigorate here in the coming months. Um, but the, the takeaway is that uh, for those who are unfamiliar, Section 842 um, establishes provisions regarding, um, you know, uh, select companies under the National Technology Investment Board, NTIB. And, um, so it's not all companies uh, that are under FOCI SSA, um, but it's a pretty good, it's a pretty healthy chunk of them. And so we had a number of waiver packages that, uh, that were processed by DCSA, uh, pretty rigorous process um, that went through all DOD um, prescribed owners um, and announced that um, the undersecretary signed uh, those waivers. Again, if you're unfamiliar, the waiver allows us to execute um, what Provided in the NDAA, um, effective 1 October 2020, allows us to kick them off now. Um, that should make a pretty healthy dent in the uh, in the in the timeline concerns that uh, certainly are our chief, but not exclusively part of the uh, the industry concerns. So I think that's really good. Our next steps on that, frankly, uh, involve us to reach out to uh, the other prescribed owners to see where they are. Uh, in this process, where, 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 where can we go in and what's the potential? We are completely flat-footed on that, so if questions come in later uh, to my colleagues up here on, on, the, on the dais, we have not had those conversations yet. So we'll own that for what it is. Um, probably different ways to slice that apple, but we decided to turn our attentions in-house before we started to, to think about it. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the other alligator that's nearest our boat right now, and uh, not, not specifically a NISPAC item, but Greg brought it up earlier, and that is uh, emerging policy pertaining to control and classified information. Um, uh, you know, so those of you who are in government or have ever been in government know that one of the great joys of working in a, in a headquarters kind of element is the development and the coordination for implementation of policy. Uh, it's a thoroughly enjoyable job that no one ever. So, um, but it's necessary, right? Baselining, uh, you know, across the expanse of the Department of Defense, uh, you know, which is kind of a big solar system that, that our colleagues in ISU, uh, you know, uh, mined for all of us. Um, but we're a big attention getter uh, as we start to think about critical technology protection. No policy is going to protect a, a one technology or all of them, but it will level set how we think about it. And that's a, that's a pretty important place. So we've got lots of attention at the highest levels within the department, uh, and that continues to stay no matter who's sitting in those seats because it's been a bit revolving here recently. Um, and uh, that, that's been steady pressure. And so I, I remain optimistic that we will see the instruction off by the end of the FY. So we'll have a further update to what that means next at an upcoming um, 
uh, NISPAC and then certainly, uh, you know, w as we continue to engage ISOO and their expanded mission responsibilities. And that concludes my Anybody have any questions here in the auditorium for uh, Jeff? Hi now, come on. <laughs> no? All right, anybody on the uh, phone have any questions for Jeff? Carolina? Anybody on the, on the WebEx for uh, Jeff? Mike Scott from DHS. Okay, Mike, yeah. uh, I just, just I don't have a question for Jeff, but uh, I do want to say for the waiver, the waiver companies for the NIDS, we really look forward to talking to you because it's through internal discussion and actually uh, glom on to what you already have in, in the evaluation. Let us know so we can start talking on uh, what we Absolutely. All right, thank you, Jeff. Sir. Right, next here from uh, Charlie Phelan. Let me just say a few words. Uh, you know, as you all know, Charlie's been the NBIB director for a while. Now he's the acting director for the Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency. Uh, I've known Charlie for years. I, I knew him uh, CIA and uh, when I was at the Department of Justice. I knew him at the FBI. Uh, the man is uh, incredible. He's uh, amazing. He seems to uh, not want to uh, permanently retire, which is a, a, a great thing for the United States. But anyway, uh, he's quite a, uh, a resource. And again, I want to uh, just take a second to recognize all you've done for the country, Charlie. I mean, you, you really have. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to stick probably with that. Thank you. Uh, and a couple other quick thanks. Fred, thank you for representing DCSA, and I guess I now have something in my inbox to figure out who your replacement looks like. Um, more specifically, Quentin, Dennis, thank you for the partnership with industry. I've known you guys for a long time, too, and I'm ability to, to contribute to this. My real question, and this is probably more for you guys, is how did you get sharp thing through security this morning? You did, Dan. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. So good news is, topic one today is not the inventory. So that's a good thing. <laughs> but it will be topic two. Um, I do want to give you a quick D uh, DCSA update here. Uh, uh, I've been saying in a number of forums for a long, long, for, uh, for a long, long time that we're going to get this executive order signed by the president any day now uh, that we'll be transferring the function. The president did sign it. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, codicils in there was that within 60 days of it's being signed that the Secretary of Defense and the Director of OPM would sign a written agreement at 60 days. So 60 days, we met that target. Uh, 67 days, I was handed a second hat. Uh, so in addition to being still the Director of N NBSA, uh and uh, until October 1st, at which point NBIB becomes wholly subsumed, merged in with the Department of Defense. Um, I think I want to take a quick moment here to thank uh, Dennis, Dennis, I'm sorry, Dan Payne, <laughs> my dear long-term friend. Uh, no, seriously, uh, uh, Dan is uh, retiring. Uh, he has, uh, in fact, I think we're having a nice down at the uh, Marine Corps uh, Museum uh, tomorrow morning. And I just want to uh, publicly thank him for all of his contributions. I don't want to all the work he has done for the federal government over the years. He um, he and I go back a very long time, back into the well into the 80s, and uh, I'd like to tell you a lot of stories, but I need to have two things in hand. One is a beer, and the other is be inside a skiff to have some of these conversations. So, well, this is not the right venue for this, but again, but just thanks to Dan. Uh, so, very quickly, uh, um, I know we have about 50 minutes to hold all the DCF. So you've got a number of folks that are going to come up and give you a brief, but some high-level stuff here. My first uh, task is to really take a look at the breadth of everything that is today in DCSA and get more familiar with all those missions, none of which are particularly foreign to me, uh, but whether it's vetting, critical technology, protection, whether it's counterintelligence, and then take a look at this and deal with this in terms of the merger. Obvious things are going to happen, have to happen on day one. We need to be able to move all of the OPM, NBIB humans, and that's roughly 3,000 and change from DOD, I'm sorry, from OPM to DOD on that number first, and uh, at the same time move sufficient funding to cover all of that, and those are all in motion. After that, then what do we do? And there's a lot of work done on this. I'll talk about that more in a minute here, but basic precept is, as, and I am 
happening within DCSA now, whether it's um, the te technology protection, whether it's the counter, a lot of things in motion, a lot of momentum right now that has been built up to get things going in the right direction. And the last thing we want to do is disturb th that next step after October 1st is going to reflect our commitment not to mess with that momentum. You'll hear more about some of that stuff here, but, but it, is, it is to keep that going and then figure out how we can gently put, start working things, processes together and further improve what we're, we think is already headed on a, uh, a very good path. Um, obviously, nobody in any of these organizations was surprised by the executive order. We've been hearing about this. proposal, And I would argue that intellectual day one for this organization was months and months gotten past that and the teams have been working together to work on this transition for an awfully long time and I'm very, very happy with what they're doing. What they're doing. That's the mic drop. Um, the, uh, with the mic. Good timing, by the way. <laughs> Let me also stop right here. The, uh, um, uh, and, and more importantly, uh, you know, how can we get everything together so the work... I would put stop what uh, Jeff said is that we have absolute... Uh, top cover and support from both the Secretary of Defense and from the USDI on any of the things we're doing here. So I'm very happy we're going in the right direction here. Uh, sort of before I move on to sort of the next next topic here, I just do want to take a second to highlight the fact that uh, a month or so ago, back in, well, back in June, um, at the NCMS uh, seminar, we did uh, uh, give out the Cogswell Awards this year, and I would just thousand or so companies that we're working with in this universe. Um, 51 of them made the cut to get these awards, and I think they deserve a lot of recognition for being really at the top end of, of, uh, of what is a well-protected ecosystem, but they really have gone well recognized here. And uh, we're, we're going to keep that going. You're going to hear more from some speakers about that, but that program will keep going. Okay, back of your minds, what's the inventory? I've got to get a question too here. So uh, you guys may recall, I think we refer to this as sort of our baseline worst day ever. It was a year ago, April, so that's about 15 months or so. 725,000 in the inventory. Uh, this Monday it is down to 386,000. Still heading south. Um, so a quick highlight, um, uh, the ones that we are most, and I think you are most concerned about, are the initial clearances. Uh, the total, and, and particularly in the national security realm, the uh, total tier three secret uh, initial investigations inventory is now about 138,000 of which are industry initial investigations. Uh, tier five, uh, our total inventory of investigations is 53,000 uh, in work, and of that number, 15,000 are in industry. Um, so if you take that total industry peak of a, with 127,000 back in that April 18 time, that number is dropping as well. Um, so uh, I, I hope you are seeing those results on, on your end of this thing. Uh, the other piece is that, that uh, through Defense Security Service, uh, old processes and continued processes in DCSA, uh, we're able to to, uh, to put a number of folks to work on inter Roughly half of that number, or of half of the total number of, of initials are on interns. I can't tell you how many are industry and how many are government, because we don't have that visibility. At least but I think it's, again, a lot of people able to get to work pretty fast. Um, the uh, timeliness numbers still have not decreased to where I want them to be. We still got a ways to go on that, but we're seeing some good progress on that, and I think some of the handouts we have is showing where some of our median numbers are, are in some very precipitously. The, uh, so uh, I'm going to just yield the floor here to Trish and others in just a minute here, but I want to get back to... Uh, to that. And you're going to hear from a, a number of folks from DCSA today talking about the personal vetting mission, talking about critical technology, talking about counterintelligence. We are building an awfully big organization, uh, pulling together an awful lot of people, a lot of contractors. Um, I know some of you in the room are, are helping us. Uh, you're a lot of this job done here, and I really appreciate that level of investment. Um, uh, we see an awful lot of synergy, an awful lot of energy. Uh, and a lot of commonality in putting all of these missions together in, in the same. Uh, we have probably the biggest darn security organization in the federal government as we get through with all this stuff. But having this as a continuous stream and understanding that, that uh, this, this works together, I think, is a, a, a critical piece here. Um, I am uh, going to stick around during the break and 
because I didn't get here early enough and answer all of those. Um, I have a friend question to you. But uh, just to sort of leave you uh, with, you know, Valerie's going to talk about Trusted Workforce 2.0 a little bit. Um, uh, we talked about that concept of Trusted Workforce. I want to get, leave a thought in your head that it is, when you think of this whole organization, trusted workplace, and at the end of the day, it's trusted work. And so with that, Patricia, you're on the stage. Here from uh, Patricia Stokes, Defense Vetting Director. Patricia, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you've obviously met my, my new boss, uh, Mr. Charlie Phelan. Um, thank you for, for having us here today. Uh, we have some, I'm going to be brief and really get to the presenters who have the information that you're very interested in, but just a few opening remarks from our DVD uh, portfolio. So first and foremost, we, as, uh, as Mr. Phelan has stated, um, we have incredible momentum in um, successfully integrating our business operation functions um, with um, the NBIB operations up at Boyers, the Mead, and, uh, and certainly the DOD CAF. We've been at this for over a year, and I can say that we are operating as one team. Um, and, and, it, and it gets better every day with the momentum that Mr. Phelan just continue to grow our enterprise business support office. Um, our Enterprise Business Support Office is working very, very closely with our National Background Investigation. Terry Carpenter is here, our Program Executive Officer, who will share some insight with you on, on where we are on uh, NBIS uh, capability and delivery. But our EBSO, as we call it, um, is, is truly the office that works side by side with Mr. Carpenter's system developers, developing the requirements testing these capabilities, interacting with the user com community to, to gauge and get their requirements and test these capabilities. Um, and again, we're not doing this in isolation. We're doing it with full agency participation in every capability that we're developing. Um, <clears throat> they, they also are preparing all of our agencies and our customers for a transition into the new National Background Investigation Services System. This is no small task. They're doing this in conjunction very, very closely with what you all might know as the customer support and engagement group that NBIB, Mr. Mark Peckerel, uh, runs up in, up in Boyers. So those agency liaisons and our EBSO are completely integrated in all of their activities. Um, I know I have two do outs and I will d discuss them. One is a having at the end of this month and one, and then we will address uh, where we're going with industry uh, on exposing them to engage you and, and share with you and get your requirements for MBIS or any concerns and, and issues. So I'll talk about that uh, secondarily. Um, the EBSO is also developing our, our rollout uh, and deployment plan. So Mr. Carpenter delivers IT, uh, and then we work with the customers to roll it out. Those things do not happen at the same time. Um, we work with Terry to develop the capabilities, but then in rolling them out, it's a phased rollout. You don't just switch a, turn a switch and uh, in the system at the, at the uh, immediate um, uh, ideal um, IT delivery date. So there's a phased rollout. It's a lot of planning. There's a lot of documentation. There's MOAs. There's financial agreements that have to be done. There's interconnectivity. Every user has a little bit, little bit of a nuance. So it's, it's um, not a one-size-fits-all. Very, very laborious task, and that's what our EBSO is also doing. The team is also responsible for piloting the potential operational uh, capabilities that Trusted Workforce 2.0 policy-wise will allow for us. Um, that's also very critical. Um, we, you know, we're, we're very grateful for our policymakers. I think for the first time, policy is going to perceive the ability to even execute, and I believe um, uh, Valerie will speak to you about that, but um, we are working very diligently. We are on the tip of that spear, and we are the executors of yeah. um, Our EBSO is also developing uh, training requirements aids. As you roll out capability, you need to have the training that goes with it. We need to understand that training up front and communicate it to, to our customers up front, another one of their, their responsibilities. I feel like I'm doing your briefing, Dr. Bar Dr. Barber will, will elaborate on this 
uh, a, a little more uh, when he gets, gets to the podium. Then we have our Vetting Risk Operations Center. They continue to expand. They are the program management office for the DOD Continuous Evaluation Program. Um, but they are, I'm glad to report, connecting to the high side data sources that the DNI provides in continuous evaluation. We as the United States government made a very deliberate um, decision that we would not duplicate efforts that the DNI is affording us um, for good government. Uh, it's the right thing to do. Um, we are tapping into the data sources that they have, uh, I'll say, and on the high side, and we have low side data sources together they combine into our continuous evaluation program and they will be critical to continuous vetting program that Trusted Workforce 2.0 will offer us in the future. Uh, the VROC is also um, very much integrating with all of the operational components in Boyers, Pennsylvania. So the fire team, uh, the quality team that sits right across the street from where we are at Fort Meade, the uh, counterintelligence support team, the background investigations, um, we are completely engaged and integrated. They've met for the past two days. Those teams specifically, uh, Artiga is here to brief you uh, on, where, on the ongoings in the VROC, but those teams are completely integrated because that's true now and in the future. We also um, have uh, the CAF and, and the um, Betting Risk Operations Center is working very closely with the CAF and our, and our own DITMAC, our insider threat uh, hub for the Uber hub, as we like to call it, for the Department of Defense. All of this being together and integrated into a single end-to-end -end enterprise makes nothing but good sense because that will take us to Trusted Workforce Chief, where we're going from a continuous vetting perspective. Heather will share with you some of the statistics. Uh, Heather Martiga is one of our senior specialists um, at the VROC, and so she's here and she'll brief you. Then we have the CAF. Uh, the CAF has a myriad of business process improvements activities going on. Mr. David Wright is here and he will share a lot of those with you. I know there's a great concern that the uh, work stations over to the CAF. Yes, it does. Um, we are addressing that. Um, we are dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. I can't speak highly enough about the senior leadership team in the CAF and the progress that they are making in their business process improvement. Um, their, their production has increased significantly over the course of the past year because of some of those, and David will share those with you. Lastly, um, as I mentioned, we, we work hand in glove with um, Mr. Terry Carpenter, our program executive officer, who is building our new IT system for us. Um, Terry will transition to DCSA as a member of DCSA um, next fiscal year, but he's operationally um, reporting to our director now. So there's, there's a, a very tight group. We are moving our enterprise business support office and his developers into the same location so they together, but they actually co-locate together. So that's, that's on the agenda too. Um, I'll end with uh, stressing from my perspective the, the importance and the opportunity that we have in, to transform these processes. I've never seen anything like it in, in my several, several years in the Department of government. But Trusted Workforce 2.0 is a reality. Um, it is the framework that we will use to truly change the vetting enterprise from a credentialing, security, and suitability, actually aligning those initi initiatives. We're excited, excited and in DCSA and DVD, direct, um, Defense Vetting Directorate, with all the components I just shared with you, we are ready uh, and, and willing and able to uh, face that, embrace that change, uh, and we want to deliver that to you. So I think um, I have two outstanding uh, questions of, for the record. Um, so one, I want to talk about um, the access to DIS that the Department of State brought up last, uh, last session. So uh, I know that our team has reached out and talked to Kim. Kim's sitting in the front row right here. And, um, but bigger than that is we've actually um, just engaged yesterday with their new director of security. We are committed and we are going to be meeting with the director of security for the Department of State in the near future uh, and talk about our more inclusive shared service model, which access to DIS or access to the appropriate components within the lease that uh, are allowed to us will be addressed in that session. So we are going to be having that session 
Um, in fact, I was engaged on email with the new director of security of the Department of State last night. So we will we will continue to work with them, and we look forward to them not just um, addressing this issue, but really what are they going to embrace from a shared service model uh, in the future. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, we talked about having a stakeholders forum with this group, with the industry. So first and foremost, we are having a stakeholders forum 29th and 30th of this month, it is July, um, and our, our EBSO along with our customer um, engagement team uh, at Boyers have been working this. It is for federal agencies. Why? Um, because we have financial agreements we need to set up with these federal agencies before 1 October to do business with DOD. That was a priority. Um, we're going to learn from that uh, forum. It's a two-day forum. Um, we had to have it two days because we had so many agencies we needed to address and so many questions and issues that we need to address to make sure that they are in uh, the DOD system on 1 October when we, when we shift to officially. So that was priority one. We will learn from that. We also intend on engaging with the NISPAC and other industry forums to understand what your concerns and your issues are so that we can, when we shape the symposium for them, uh, for you guys, uh, we, we will do it with your input so when we come to the table and have the symposium, we're addressing your issues. So I'm looking at, uh, Clinton, uh, first quarter of 20 or second quarter of 20 to have that. It will depend on when we are comfortable, you and us, that we have the right issues addressed and we have the forum to, to do it. Is on the agenda for the new fiscal year. That's all I have, and I will be followed, and I'll, ask, I'll see if there's any questions, but I will be followed. So Ms. Ms. Heather Mardiga will be here, and she's going to brief the VROC um, that I mentioned. Mr. Wright will brief the CAF, and then Dr. Barber uh, we'll follow up with the EBSO and any other questions you might have on that. And then certainly, um, not least, last and least, but Mr. Carpenter will give you the, um, the all-important NBIS update. I have one question. Okay, so with regard to this, I talked you, uh, to your person. You yourself first, oh, Kim Bogger, State Department. Yeah. I talked to your staff member Tuesday evening. She was on vacation, but we talked on her cell phone. Um, but I have one question, because maybe to clarify what she, in essence, told me. What I got out of the conversation was, okay, we already know we never got JPASS access. That's an old story for some, but still an issue for me. From the time I asked about when non-DOD agencies would get access to this, no one really has addressed it. No one has really said until the other night when she pretty much told me that I'm not, we're not going to get it, nor are any other non-DOD agencies, because it wasn't formatted. And again, I'm not a technical person. Whatever agreements you all put in place, no one ever thought when they designed it that all the stuff that had to go into place for non-DOD agencies to get it, whether it was lawyers or agreements, whatever it is. So I just want to clarify that we're really not going to get this access. I'm not going to go on record saying you're not going to get this access. You're going to get the information you need out of this to do your job. And what we will do um, is work with, um, because I, I really look forward, Kim, to be honest with you, working with your agency writ large to talk about a much broader shared service model, which would include this and access to the elements of this that you need to, to ex execute your responsibilities in accordance with laws, SORNs, and, and things of that nature. So I think when, when you spoke with perhaps the staff member, I think the, it, the results of that conversation sounded a little bit more black and white. I'm a little more optimistic that we have much, much more to discuss and talk about in a shared service model moving forward. And that will be accepted. Right, you guys are meeting with all of them as well? That have we are, and them. that's why it's such a large task for our EBSO. So we have an investigative part as well that has issues that will be a part of those. Just Correct. Right, okay. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Patricia here in the auditorium? Zadiah Taylor Dunn, NASA. Um, I was, had a question because we hadn't been contacted, so I'm not sure if there's a way to get in touch with you all to find out how to get involved with this process. Absolutely. And Dr. Chuck Barber, who will be on the podium, uh, I would suggest you guys make sure you meet during the break and exchange contact information uh, because you, you should have been contacted. I don't know. I mean, sometimes information goes into the very senior levels of the organizations and doesn't get pushed down. So I, I, I don't know, but we will, we will address that. 
Anyone else for Patricia in the auditorium? Caroline, any questions on the, on the web? Any questions for Patricia on the phone? I'll hear from Heather Mardell. Good morning. My name is Heather Mardiga. I'm the Deputy Director of the Vetting Risk Operations Center with CCSA. Uh, I would like to provide you with an update of our uh, where we're at this fiscal year. Um, you'll see that we have processed over 100,000 in, um, investigation submissions. We, our current inv investigation inventory is at 17,000. We actually have deferred over 40,000 industry periodic reinvestigations into continuous evaluation. We have issued over 73,000 interim determinations, and we are averaging 15 to 20 days for our interim determination. Moving over to continuous evaluation and the update for that, as Ms. Stokes mentioned, we are aggressively working to expand both the population into continuous evaluation and the data sources. So currently, as of today, we have 1,351,551 individuals enrolled in the DE low side data sources. These data sources primarily cover financial, criminal, public records, and eligibility. As of that population, you will see that industry comprises 27% of the CE population to date. In regards to our continuous evaluation alerts, as of today, we are at 83,503 alerts, and approximately 57% of those alerts are valid. Of those valid alerts, we are at a 52% rate of the information not previously being known, and so therefore VROC has to take appropriate action on those. So this E model is continuing to allow us to be able to identify those potential indicators early on and to be able to provide an individual with the opportunity to address and mitigate those triggers and with the goal of um, being able to mitigate insider threat. I want to make sure that I um, highlight that we have uh, provided and updated frequently asked questions on the periodic investigation deferment activity on the DCSA website. We have um, updated those questions to ensure that they are also covering um, some issues such as when do I need to submit an EQIP uh, for an overdue periodic reinvestigation, what to do if an employee is uh, transferring to another company, what do I need to do if I'm working with non-DOD um, agencies and to validate CE um, deferment for them, and um, how do I know if my employee is deferred. And of course, anytime you have any of those questions, you can reach out to us via our mailbox, and we will be able to provide that feedback and that support to you. In regards to disk provisioning status, I want to make sure that everybody is aware that on August 1st, we will be only accepting the SF-312 non-disclosure agreements and the customer service requests, those that, you know, those were, that were formerly the RRUs and JPAS, only through DIS. So it's really imperative that everyone obtain their DIS account prior to August 1st. As of right now, we have 33% of NIST companies provisioned and active in DIS. We do have a staff that um, is working this daily and is up to date on um, provisioning. So again, encourage everyone to get in. We do have step-by-step -step provisioning instructions. Those are located on the front page of the DCSA website. Um, we are also going to be working with the industrial security representatives for companies that are not compliant to help uh, with that process. And again, this is for the ultimate goal of being able to get us all into one system, which would be this, and to be able to sunset JPAS so we aren't working on two different systems. So with that update, um, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Hello. Okay, this is Dennis Keith, industry. On the uh, CE alerts received, uh, you said a number with regards to the number that are valid. Correct. What was that? Uh, the number that are valid is 57% of mm -hmm. the 83,000. 57%? Correct. Uh, is there a target that you're trying to get to in terms of um, uh, about 
80%, 90%? Of course, as we, we are always looking to increase that number. A lot of it has to do with functionality and business rules and automation. So we are always looking to increase that um, number, and that's what we're working through with our low side data sources as we continue to progress into continuous study. What would you say is the uh, uh, cause for 43% not being valid indicators? Uh, so that is a difference in turning on different data sources and having to work through the nuances of those data sources to ensure that the business rules are the right elements and the right data points and um, at the level that we need. So many times it takes a few times, just like turning on any program, you go through a couple of different beta phases before you are able to hit the right. So we are constantly adding the data sources to be able to start going into the continuous vetting compliance. I think we're going to be hopefully seeing this number increase in validity, and it's going to be fluctuating until we get a, um, we have all the data sources online. Uh, could I ask the chair to sort of uh, consider that as an action item to follow up on the next next uh, this package? Good morning. Good morning, Catherine Kaley from Industry. Um, industry is seeing a lot of times where people are listed in JPAS but not in DIS, and come one August they can't submit the SF-312 if the person is not in DIS, and we're being told not to put them into DIS. So we have um, security professionals that are faxing the SF-312s in, mm -hmm. but being told by the receiving end that they're not accepting them via fax and they need to submit them via the DIS, which they can't do because the person doesn't exist. Do you have any guidance on how that is actually supposed to be implemented, how we're supposed to submit the SF-312 if the person is not listed in the DIS account? So um, I would say take a look at the tips and tricks in regards to making sure that your hierarchy and everything is resolved. If that is, if that is in fact accurate, well, one, we, we're not going to actually enforce this until August 1st. So I would encourage you to respond back to the Ask the Rock mailbox. Um, that individual works directly for me. And questions that we can get you the support and we can figure out what the underlying root issue is and help you resolve it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, Heather. Hi. This is Leonard Moss, Industry. So uh, along the same lines of what Kathy was saying, we're seeing a lot of problems with data in the new system. There's a lot of data missing. There's a lot of folks that's not in there that should be in there from our cage code that's in JPAS. And then there's a lot of people who are in there who are no longer in our cage code. I'm really concerned about the sunset because JPAS is accurate, this is not. What are you guys doing as far as quality control and how can we address this because we can no longer do RRUs? So we're having real challenges getting the data accurate in DISS. Right. Um, so we are constantly working back and forth with the DMDC as well as the CAF in regards to trying to ensure that those data systems match up and align to the best of our ability. This is been the ongoing struggle with having two different data um, systems, which is why we're moving for the to, to the DIS, and that's why we strategically only wanted to do um, the 312 and the RUs first before and doing this as a gradual, so that we can work out those kinks as they occur. Um, and I do have staff um, that is ramped up, ready for this August August first date to be able to address those issues. So. I would say if you already know of certain issues in regards to people being out, please either talk to me offline or let's send um, an email over to our box so we can try to work with the right entity that help you get that resolved um, before August 1st, but then even after August 1st, we're standing by ready to assist. We know it's not going to be clean and it's not going to be perfect, but we are prepared to um, help and ensure that we can make this as Questions for Heather in the auditorium? Um, Heather, Greg Pannoni, I assume. Could yeah. you repeat the number percent that are provisioned as of this time, 33? Right, 33% okay. um, are provisioned into this as of right now. And that, that on the face of it, it sounds like 33%, and then August 1st we're going to turn something off and go the other way. That, that's not... So uh, we have been working very closely with uh, industry partners, and we are prepa prepared for this. Um, and we will work collaboratively as a team to move forward into this direction. Um, we have been working diligently to moving everybody towards being provisioned into this, 
and um, we do, are do going to Do you expect that to happen by August 1st, to have everyone provisioned? Let me put it this way. I have realigned staff to help support when this occurs. So um, we have been advertising this for a while. Um, this is not uh, mm -hmm. new news. So, and again, we, this is being very strategic in regards to just doing the NDAs and the RRUs um, as the first step. Step one in multiple steps till we get to our final IT solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Mark Perkle, National Background. Is... Nope, he's, he's not. Strike him. All right, Mariana Martineau, DOD Consolidated Adjudication Facility. I, I, I'm not as pretty as Mariana. Sorry. Yes, Sorry, just not at all. Not at all. Uh, I am uh, David Wright from the, the DOD CAF, uh, and now forming underneath the DCSA, you know, the population for uh, industry and how we are addressing uh, those adjudications. So, as you can see here, we've divided uh, the population into three portfolios. Uh, the current work in progress, the 36,000 that you see in the slide, are divided into the readiness and the risk management portfolios, those are the active. For the readiness portfolio, we've designed these to get people to work. As you can see here, the categories of the T3s, the T1s, the T5s. Uh, that slide reflects 22 days. Uh, as of yesterday, the July numbers were around 12. So uh, right now we're seeing um, uh, some good progress in that. Uh, this population also includes the SCIs, the KMPs, the reciprocity requests, and of course the RRUs. Again, this is all engineered to get as many people to work as quickly as possible. The second portfolio, the risk management portfolio, is engineered to address the threat or the risk to the Department of Defense and its population. As you can see here, it addresses those uh, periodic reinvestigations that have been deemed medium or high risk by MBIB, as well as other indicators of potential threats to national security or, again, to the DOD population. So, again, managing that risk to the department. The third port Portfolio you see on the bottom there, the deferred, uh, again, as eligibilities no longer uh, expire, uh, we have created a deferred population. This is the, the folks um, whose adjudication has been deferred as they've been deferred by no risk by MBIB. This allows us to focus our energies on those top two uh, portfolios you see there in uh, readiness and the risk. Right. Uh, many of our uh, strategic priorities there are aligned with um, DCMA, uh, uh, MBIBs as far as addressing our aging inventory, reducing that, as well as reducing the size and, and the timeliness of uh, our inventory. Um, at the same time, we continue to improve the quality and the consistency of our adjudications and the business processes surrounding them, uh, mainly by those of efficiency initiatives that you see there on the right side. Of we have several Lean Six Sigma um, programs going on to help us with our efficiencies. As we move underneath the CSA, we are reorganizing uh, to create specialized teams and, and task organized to help us find greater efficiencies and to improve our training opportunities and improve our, consist our uh, consistency in our adjudications. Lastly, we're addressing the process with reciprocity uh, to make sure that that is happening as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Questions? Any questions for David in the auditorium? I have a question. Uh, Greg Pannoni, I see. So just if you could, on the deferred population, which is pretty sizable, um, to, to break this down, do we know that they're low risk or no risk prior to doing the investigation, or does this only inform us after the investigation is completed? And is this part of a temporary measure because we're catching up and enrolling people in CE? Yes, sir. Thank you for your question. So, yes, these are the uh, low to no risk that have been deemed by MBIB after the investigation has been completed. So it's, it's kind of a, a second uh, phase, if you would, for Trusted Workforce 2.0. Um, so that suggests there's like some minimal level of, of review, uh, for lack of using a better term. There's something that tells us they're low or no risk. Yes. 
Yes, there is. So, uh, yes, I'm mean, not to get into the weeds, but MBIB will go through a suitability uh, determination and they uh, they code the cases. So these are the ones that have been determined as a, a no okay. or low risk, according to the issues in it. Yes, ma'am. So as Ms. Stokes uh, stated, as we look at these cases, and we do review them from time to time to ensure that we're not missing anything, uh, again, um, due to the, the issues, if any at all were identified, uh, none of these were into due process, none of them met the process or, or revocation or, uh, or being revoked. Just looking at the process, and maybe it's premature, but certainly, ideally, if we can avoid doing the investigation and just enroll them in CE, would save time, right? At the yes. end of it, maybe a little bit more risk, but yes, uh, and that is certainly the intent. Uh, you know, going forward with truck, uh, Trusted Workforce 2.0, uh, oh, okay. this is the population that was kind of we had already started the investigation. Gotcha. Well, the gotcha. investigation had already been completed. That's, at that time. that's good. Thank you. Thanks. There is a question here from Mark um, Ryan. Are the efficiency initiatives in order of priority? Why would re reciprocity be last? Uh, no, they're not in the order of, of priority. Good, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now we'll hear from Dr. Charles Barber, Enterprise Business Support Office. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I think if I had to truly talk about everything that we're doing in the EBSO, I would need about three hours. I don't have three hours this morning. So I will talk very briefly about some of the key uh, events and milestones that we have uh, coming up uh, to you on the horizon. So in May, uh, we started our usability testing with some of our early offerings, uh, EAP and uh, Embus Agency. Uh, we also ensured that we had CE enrollment data was visible for you in this. Uh, in July, we just recently had our kickoff meeting with several of our industry partners. Uh, it was a, a kickoff for our TIP pilot, and TIP, for, for those of you who don't know, is, is the way we want to maximize the use of that upfront information uh, to satisfy investigative and security requirements. Uh, industry was very well represented. Uh, I don't want to exhaust the list of, of partners who, were, who participated, but, but the industry was very, very well represented. And, and hopefully what we learned from that pilot will be able to replicate on, on the government side with our government partners also. Uh, moving to August, uh, we will continue uh, this upgrade, uh, and some of those upgrades range from how we prioritize customer service requests uh, to how we address latency issues that have been reported by many of you uh, through Quentin and through multiple calls to me and emails from Quentin. Uh, but, but you know, through our partnership with with, with Quentin, the NISPAC, uh, and our work that we're doing with Mr. Carpenter, uh, we are definitely addressing those issues as we look to. Uh, derive requirements and move functionality over to some of our new, our new offerings. Moving to October, uh, this is where we will finalize that concept of our tip pilot. Uh, we'll also start the initiation of moving our industry partners over to our new uh, initiation services with uh, EAP and Embus Agency, and that will be a phased implementation. And then moving to the start of the year, uh, this is where we'll continue transformation and transition activities uh, to include operationalizing and finalizing our tip concept. Uh, and sunsetting, sunsetting JPAS and fully adopting this in some of our end services. Um, in keeping with stakeholder inclusiveness, uh, any effort that we support within the EBSO, we always welcome the opportunity to allow our industry and our government partners to participate. Uh, so in terms of usability testing and how we want to start to migrate our partners into our, our initiation services, uh, I encourage you to reach out to the POC that you see listed on the, on the slide. Her name is Ms. Alicia Peoples. Uh, and she will definitely help do what she can to get you set up to participate in, in our usability testing and some of our early uh, activities that we have going in the EBSO. Any, any questions? Charles, hi. This is Valerie Heil, DOD. I just want to clarify on your slide. Could we go back to it for just a moment? Yeah, one more. So I just want to say January 2020, where it says sunset, J-PASS, and fully adopt DISS. At the meeting the other day where this was briefed, it's, it's the understanding, is it not, that it is to begin the process. Correct. 
to sunset. That's correct. Because I don't want, I want to be sure that out of this meeting there's not public notice that JPAS sunsets January 2020. No. Absolutely. The process continues to get to that. That so, is correct. Okay. Margaret State Department, um, where does CVS fit into all of this? Because that's the one thing we have access to. So where is this in the whole process? So we do have a more robust delivery, IT delivery and capability delivery model. Uh, again, I, I cannot cover everything that we're working and supporting currently within the EDSO, uh, but I'm trying to recall how we have that tag on our delivery map. I want to say it's fourth quarter by 20, but I will get back to you with a definite. With a definite it's going to be around, correct? It's not leaving. So we have CVS on the roadmap to roll into NBIS, which is what I believe Ms. Dr. Barber is alluding to now, but we also have some interim steps to get the appropriate information into CVS that all of you want um, prior to that. So we have a manual process first. We will go to an automated process to populate CVS and also populate scattered castles. And then we will then ultimately roll that capability along the, the bigger, broader roadmap of deployment of NBIS activity. Just to be clear. Questions for Dr. Barber? Right. <clears throat> We're going to hear from Terry Carpenter, National Background Investigations uh, Service. Thank you. Um, does anybody know this Terry Carpenter guy? Because I was doing the word count earlier, and that seems to be the most common thing said all day long. I'm a little worried about that. I don't think it's me anymore. Uh, but now I am Terry Carpenter. I'm from this. Uh, I've been doing the PEO for the National Background Investigation Service, uh, the Program Executive Office, and I am transitioning with the program over to DCSA in the end of FY20. That's more of a paperwork drill, as you heard about all the work with the transfer and the merger. Same thing is happening with our program as we move over. We're moving to people, but right now we're operating as one organization. So I don't know if you've heard today, but you've heard the term change quite a lot. And I'm telling you, we're in the middle of some major change, and there's a lot more major change to come. And I, and I appreciate all the insight from our industry partners on how that change impacts you and how we can make it better. If you've seen this picture before, it's a common picture we use to kind of describe the scope of what's in NBIB. The big thing to take away is the list is getting longer, right? Change is driving new requirements. We've heard continuous evaluation evolving to continuous vetting. We've heard about the low side repository. How do we get the information in the hands of everybody who needs it? Those things are all being incorporated as we go through this evolution of building this new service with an underlying IT system to help deliver it. And I can't say enough about the partnership that we've had with our DOD entities, with my business partner on the DVD side that owns this business process transformation effort, and with our, our industry and other federal agencies who are coming to the table to give us that insight as we go along. So if you're familiar with the old, I've heard a lot of terms of system names. And as an IT person, I think about how hard that is from a user perspective, whether you're an industry in DOD or another federal agency. It's one of the pillars of what we're trying to do here. The first pillar is we're going to make something truly secure in a different way from the inside of the application out, not just protecting things at the boundary and at the perimeter. So we're building security inside the actual application architecture. And this architecture is going to be the foundation for enterprise architecture for us going forward for a lot of what we need to do in the future. At the second pillar is business transformation. You've heard before how important transforming the process is. You're hearing about those changes right now. I hear some of the pain of that change, and that's normal. So we're making sure that that architecture can support the rapid pace of change and keep up. We're really excited about the opportunity to adjust and really support Trusted Workforce 2.0 and really try to achieve 
those new trusted workforce investigative tiers being delivered as close to a new policy being signed as possible. Sometimes that's hard in IT. You hear the word years following a change in policy. We're looking to do it a lot. Uh, we think we can with this. And the third pillar is user experience. Really, we're trying to focus on user experience. Our users, whether in a federal agency, DOD, or industry partner group, are dealing with modern capabilities every single day in and out of work. So we're trying to bring those same best practices, those same capabilities, to make that user experience much better inside this application. Having a user sitting in a chair and swiveling to five or six different windows on their screen and trying to figure out which one do I open up while they were a DOD employee and then going out and joining industry and working for you all, and then going and having to go to different screens and try to figure out what that's like. So as part of this transformation, not only are we transforming process and building a more secure foundation in the application, but we're really going to look at that user experience. And that's really what you're seeing on the right-hand side, is that modern architecture, building security into the application architecture, building the foundations and good hygiene required for data analytics, right? If you've ever tried to do data analytics, it's easy if you have good data, you trust that data, you understand that data, and you can get access to that data. And I'm telling you, that's not easy to do to get all those things to come together. So we're building all those foundations into the enterprise architecture for NBIS and for the future of DCSA so that we'll have all that good hygiene that you would expect from a modern IT system. Lastly, I just want to put a few things in here to show. We've been busy. We've been rolling out regular releases. Those releases today haven't been as focused on the user experience of capability getting in the hands of users, but a lot of stuff in the back behind the scenes. Building that foundation I talked about, being able to manage that data, control it, secure it, know what it is, protect it, put proper policies around it for that future analytics. Building those initial capabilities, changing the experience of the subject as they sit in front of that long form called the SF86. Really focusing on the CE process. We found tremendous business value in as we talked about earlier, those investigative cases that can be pushed into CE now um, and what we're doing with the future with CV. Really, again, getting that data broker, the data foundations done so that we can really move into those advanced analytic capabilities. And then right around the corner is the rest of the investigative tiers, again, following that trusted workforce 2.0 definition as it gets signed and getting into the additional capabilities to make that user experience for you and industry much better, much faster, and much easier. So there's a lot of things that are being discussed that haven't put into official plans. I don't have an official plan for anything like that yet today, but I can't say that that's not in the discussions in the back. Greg Pannoni, ISOO. Uh, I don't want to mischaracterize this, but it sounds a little bit like we're uh, flying the aircraft and updating it concomitantly at the same time. Uh, are we confident that um, from a security assurance, cyber resilience uh, perspective that we're not going to run into what happened before uh, the OPM data breach or something similar to that? We're confident. Okay. I, I will say we have not done this in the shadows of a single room with a single group. You know, there's a lot of tremendous depth of skills in the areas that are concerning uh, that we've had on the team day to day as part of the build and design process and also as part of the oversight process, reviewing those decisions of how we're designing, how we're building. We have a pretty structured governance around the technology side with the right ex 
respected players within the department who have that expertise. Any other questions for Terry in the auditorium? Thank you, Terry. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from uh, Chris Forrest, who will give us an update on what's going on down at DCS. Yeah, Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Forrest. I'm the um, Deputy Assistant Director for the um, NIST Policy um, Office. Um, under ISIA. As you can see, I am not Keith Menard. Um, today is his um, 55th birthday, and I told him that I would cover for him as a, for, for a birthday present. And I told him when my birthday comes, I expect him to paint my house multiple times. <laughs> so um, let's just go ahead and start out. First, I want to echo um, thanks to um, um, me and um, Dennis as well for their uh, participation forward to continuing that. Uh, Quentin, no matter where I go, it seems like I always see you. Uh, so that's not a, I think we'll continue that relationship on going. But thank you both for your participation. We really appreciate it. Um, also, would like to welcome um, one of the newer members to the um, National Industrial Security Program, the Department of Veterans Affairs. It is now 33rd um, agency to sign the agreement with uh, um, for industrial security services. So I'm not sure if they're in the audience today, but I wanted to welcome, to welcome them to the program as well. Jump right in here with, uh, we're going to go right to the um, uh, National Industrial Security System, good old NIST. Um, some of the things that are going on right now, um, I know there has been some talk, uh, some latency issues, um, access um, things going on. Um, we're working diligently to uh, correct those uh, issues as they come about. Uh, one of the things that has happened is the uh, call center as of May 1st, um, DCSA's call center, we've updated that uh, for additional function and technical resources. So we're hoping that's going to help get more answers out to um, not just the industry but government as well. Um, we're also, um, right now we have about 80% of um, cage codes registered within NIST. Get that, continue to move forward with um, getting that to 100%. Um, so we're working on that as well. Um, one of the do outs um, that I believe um, Mr. Pinoy discussed was uh, industry and government um, um, continue to provide requirements and recommendations for the system. And we're, um, we have a, um, a meeting uh, scheduled for August for industry and government to come and we'll sit down. There'll be more information coming, but we'll have a, a NISC, uh, NISC group to uh, sit down and walk through some of the issues and some of the positives that are also going through. I don't want to make it all. Can we continue to move forward with that? Um, next uh, system is our uh, is NCCS uh, 254, the um, NISC contract classification system. Um, we have about 60% of the information that's coming into that system right now is, and we're still working with our DOD components to increase their uh, NCCS use. Um, our uh, DOD components continue to update policies and processes to reflect NCCS use within their organization. All the mill depths, um, and again, I want to thank um, uh, Sharon Dollinger for Air Force has taken the lead on that, and they've really been a good partner um, working with us to work through some of the issues associated with NCCS. Thank you, Sharon. We really appreciate that. We're also, from an NCCS standpoint, uh, we continue to um, look at, uh, we have three engineering change proposals that we have out right now, where we're and one of those is trying to look at Again, and, uh, how about the non-DOD agency? How are they going to play into this? How is that going to work? So we're working through that. I want to make sure that every, our non-DOD partners um, realize that we haven't forgotten about you. 
we know you're out there, so we want to make sure that you're still that we engage you as well. Quick CDSC update: uh, There's a virtual um, security conference July 24th. Um, I have in big bold letters that's a government registration, government attendance for this year only. Um, you can go on our website if you're interested as a government member. Sign up for that. Next year, there will be an industry government will have access. It'll be a both um, um, government and industry will uh, be able to participate in that. That's coming next year. So um, don't don't take offense, industry. We didn't forget about you again. Um, we just. Uh, there's also several DIT uh, webinars that are um, currently under, that are posted. I'm not going to go through them, but as you have questions and things arise with DIT, um, look at those webinars and also do not be afraid to contact uh, your local uh, field offices and also um, our headquarters element to continue to um, get a better understanding of where we're going in that. Any questions so far? I'm kind of rambling here. So, Valerie, please. Hi, Valerie Howell, DOD. Just to give an update about um, NCCS usage, um, and I'll send a notice to the NISPAC members, but as of July 12th, the Federal Register now includes a notice out for public comment, amend the security requirements in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, um, require use of the DCSA managed NCCS automated 254. Uh, it does include a requirement for DOD components and those non DOD agencies with DOD industrial. It does include a provision for any of those non DOD agency legacy systems to continue. Federal notice. 2019-14379. Thank you, Valor. Um, Mr. Spinager um, uh, hit this topic uh, during his um, his comments uh, concerning um, the uh, 842 NIT, um, and it also uh, Mr. Pinoni also addressed it. As, um, this is a bid. This is really a big, um, a big deal, um, especially for someone like me that's been around through changes for one agency. Um, so I've watched this NID process kind of go through the whole, um, the whole iteration. I won't tell you how many years that is because I don't want to give away my age, but um, it is a big deal, and it's worth noting that um, there was a lot of effort between industry, government, um, and inside of government to uh, get this process and get these, um, these waivers um, um, approved and we're moving out on them. I believe this is also going to help us with efficiencies for other NIDs. That's going to address, uh, Mr. Pannoni, the uh, um, backlog that's um, some of the numbers. totally think that's going to help out approximately 19 facilities that are covered under that waiver. Um, so, and we'll continue to move forward with that. But again, that's really going to help that process out tremendously. Um, that's a that's a good news story for everybody in here. Wanted to give a quick uh, update on um, uh, EMAS. This is part of the uh, NISO um, NISA working group. The uh, EMAS is um, alive and well, effective um, May. Um, May 6th of this year, IS authorizations and reauthorizations are, were, were needed to be submitted to MAS. Um, I want to remind everybody that no later than 30 September of uh, this year, um, industry partners must transfer their authorization letters and all supporting um, artifacts for all existing authorizations from OBMS to uh, EMS. So um, refer to your NISP EMS job aid help you work through that. Again, if you have some problems with that, please reach out to your local field offices, your regions, and even give it. And 
also I don't, um, one more, this was a big, uh, big bold on my uh, talking points was uh, please get ready for Windows 7 upgrade. I don't have to tell you about all that that's coming um, to um, make sure that you uh, are ready for uh, from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Um, that'll be something that we'll be looking at. That's not effective till 14 um, January of 2020, but might as well start now. Any questions so far? Okay, last uh, bullet that I have is I uh, wanted to just briefly discuss um, advisory committee. Um, our industrial uh, advisory committee on industrial security, industrial based policy. Up to this point, uh, we've been fairly uh, vague about the process, where we're going, what we're doing. Um, we still are in the process of vetting um, not just government members, but also industry members. One of the concerns I know for this group was uh, would there be mispack representation on that um, that committee? And I can tell you that um, we, I'm with, uh, pretty confident that uh, that um, that representation will be there, and it will be at a fairly high level. So, just if you bear with me, I think it all come together, and we'll be able to uh, share more information after um, the final vetting process. Any questions? Kind of ran through that a little, little quick. For Chris in the auditorium. Thanks, sir. Appreciate Thank it. you. It's good to you, Yeah. All right. Mystery presentation. Mr. Wilkes, your swan song, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I want to thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to, to represent industry. Um, I've had a, a really Learning experience over the last four years. I put it that way. Um, I also want to thank Dennis um, for his participation and leadership. I couldn't have did it without him. We have many a calls about uh, challenges and issues and, and how to uh, put it in the right verbiage um, in, a, in, a, in a way that everybody will accept it. Okay? Um, so, without uh, further ado, what, what we want to talk a little bit about is uh, the NISPAC and the MOU membership. We're going to get into some policy changes and what we think some of the impacts are going to be. We're going to talk a little bit about new business, um, some, some continued business. Uh, we're going to address some of maybe some specific challenges we're having with the systems, and then we'll finish it up with old business. Um, the first thing that, of course, that we, we need to talk about is myself and Dennis Keith are. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, myself and Dennis Keith are coming off in September, and we'll be having elections in the upcoming weeks to uh, select two new members that will follow us um, one October. Okay, so, so that will be coming. Look for the emails um, on, you know, process of, of being able to submit someone. If when it comes to the, the MOUs, we do have uh, a couple of new MOUs. We have Joseph Krause, who's, who's the new assistant. Uh, Person. We have Kathy Coe, who's the new president for NCMS, and um, Charlie Sal for, for the PSC. So I want to thank you guys. Next slide. When it comes to the policy changes, um, one of the things that we're taking a really close look at is deferring of investigations that are pending adjudication of the CAF. Um, we've heard a lot about you know how this is going to help uh, clear up space so that they can adjudicate um, the issue cases, but we still want to take a look at this because if no to no risk cases, you know, maybe something that we can put in place so that members on in the field actually know that the case is being deferred. At the moment, there's no way that on the industry side of the house from looking in JPAS or looking in DISC that we know that the case is deferred. It just says pending adjudication at the CAF. So hopefully moving forward we'll have that and, and hopefully that some type of change will, will come into place. Um, when it comes to uh, the, in the last meeting we talked about accountability for top secret material and, and we asked for more guidance and a, a, a good thing is there's draft ISL out right now on, uh, on the accountability for top secret material in electronic form. Um, we're providing comments. Um, back now, they're not done, but we're, we're working on getting the comments 
comments collected and, and back to the and back to the government. I'm sorry. Next slide. Talked a lot about um, having working groups and different things in place to work to work with the government. Um, in previous meetings, we, we've come to a lot of meetings and said, hey, you know, these are things that we're working and we need answers, we want answers, that kind of thing. Um, we, were, we, we asked to put working groups in place. Um, Mark really pushed putting working groups in place. We put the work, and now we're really starting to make progress. You know, we got a couple of ISLs that are, have been out for comment. We provided comment. We're made, waiting on, um, you know, feedback based on what we presented. I know one of the ISLs that, that came out that we had a lot of comments on was investment reporting, and uh, Valerie already said that you know that's something that they're working on. I can tell you that we did address the CBD and a whole lot of other things, and I'm sure it's going to take a process that it has to go through before they can come back and say this is what we are. So we're hoping we're going to see those type of things soon. Um, we've made a huge step forward when it comes to the NID process. I mean, we've, every meeting since I've been on this pack for four years, we've talked about NIDs. And to be able to, for 19 companies. Now, I have on the slide deck uh, BAE, is that because BAE was the first, and then we didn't find out about the 19 until Monday. So, but but it's, it is more companies than just BAE. Um, but, but that's a huge step forward. Hopefully, moving forward, we'll be able to, to put a working group together and talk about the SEI piece, and, and that'll be critical. That'll be the critical. The next step that's going to be critical to closing the gap on the new process and maybe coming up with um, solutions that, that we can process better and faster. Next slide. Um, when it comes to uh, CUI, we're, we're just you know waiting to see. Um, how the cybersecurity maturity model is going to play into CUI moving forward. Um, the NISPAC gathered information um, from industry partners. We, su we submitted the information you know, on current methods of assessment and provided it to the ISU in June. And uh, we're just waiting comments to see where we're going to go from there. Um, but we are engaged. Again, the working groups are, are in place. We're trying to work with the government um, and provide what we think are some concerns and challenges, excuse me, concerns and challenges moving forward, so that we can hope better process and, and, and um, so that so that we don't have so many problems moving forward. Next slide. When it comes to DIT, we we, we talk about it and we talk about it and we talk about it, um, and it, it's here. It's not something that's coming. Uh, so one of the things that uh, industry has a concern is, is when it comes to how long it takes for um, how long it takes for the, the tailored security plans to be put in place. Um, out of 100 companies that have been through the comprehensive security review, only 50 have TSPs in place. So we need to take a look at what is the holdup, what's, what's causing the, the stoppage of of moving forward with these, um, it's going to it's, it's going to be a really difficult sell if moving forward everybody's going to be required to TS, a TSP. If it we need to refine the, the process fit for the TSP. Um, we did have a working group in March to address some of our concerns, and, and we talked about a lot of concerns. And so we'll have to see in the next working group how, um, based on what we brought up and what our concerns were, what is these changes moving forward. Right now we don't know. Um, all we can say is we addressed a lot of concerns and, we, and we're waiting for them to come back and say, hey, this is where we are in the process. Next slide. When it comes to trusted workforce, um, we, we requested a meeting with DNI, which, they, which we had in March. It was a really good meeting. They talked to us about the way forward. We also talked to them about what can we do to help them as we move forward and, and what can industry do to make the processes better to help them come up with processes that are going to be effective and, and that are going to be something that um, we talked a lot about uh, where they want to go in the future and, and 
actually to the point of maybe having tabletop exercises based on some of the things, uh, some of the ideas that they come up with to see, you know, what we think and what the impact may be on industry moving forward. So we're, we're really engaged with, with you know, I and the trusted workforce piece. Um, we, we're still trying to make sure that we have some representation in, in all of the meetings that, in, you know, that somebody from industry is there can, can address the concerns. And that's something that they're working with us on to, to hopefully we'll be able to have something like that in place moving forward. Next slide. When it comes to uh, the systems, I mean, as you guys have heard it, we're having, you know, some latency problems with a lot of the systems. Um, when it comes to, to DSS, I mean, to, to DISS and, and making the transition from JPAS, we are having some data problems. We, we addressed this in numerous meetings that we're having data problems with information in one system but not in the other system. So, so we know we have some work ahead, but we have addressed those concerns and we're working government again and multiple working groups to come up with what we can do to, to help this process. One of the things that ties industry hands is we don't have the ability to, to do anything. That's a system problem and it's something that DCSA is going to have to figure out on their side to make sure that the two systems are talking. And one of the things that, that we're taking a look at is as we make the transition to um, DISS being a system of record, it is going to be extremely difficult to submit and, and do some of the things the government wants us to do if the person's information is. So what we have to do is take a look at um, the data, work with the government and see if we add the data into this, is that going to be acceptable uh, or is it going to make duplications? These are things that we're going to have to take a look at, uh, take a look at sure that whatever we do to help ourselves so that we can help the government, that's something moving forward. And we're not going to know that until we start doing those things and working with the government to be able to test it. One of the things we ask from the government is as they move forward with multiple systems in the future, a lot of the systems that they're beta testing right now only work with a CAC card. And it's really hard for industry to participate. CAC is required. You're going to have to come up with systems that that allow CACs and PKI because PKI is what industry use. So if you're going to want industry involved from the beginning, which is where you want us, so that we can help you make something that's going to be, you know, acceptable and it's going to work, you're going to have to take a look at your systems and make sure that they work with both CAC and PKI as we move into the future. Next slide. We still have con some concerns with small businesses. Um, we did. NCMS did do a white paper to talk about consultants and, and what can, consultants can do. We asked DCSA for, uh, to provide uh, some policies on consultants and, and uh, they did provide us some guidance back. They answered the white, a lot of the questions that we had in the white paper. They were, you know, that were problems that they could handle internally, but we're still waiting for some answers specifically when it comes to um, and whether uh, consultants can be account managers and, and how they can participate more um, when they're working with their customers in the field. So, um, again, that's one of the things we're, we're waiting for additional. Next slide. Come to the seeds. Uh, you know, we're still waiting for, um, or we're still waiting on um, information on, C, on the C3 ISL. We did provide comments, but as Valerie was saying, it's something that, that they're working on and, and we'll have to see when we're going to see the final on that in the future. So again, that, that's something that um, we're, we're looking forward to. Hopefully we can see it before it's, it's out and released to everyone else. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the, the seeds and draft seeds, again, we're working with the DNI. Um, they're doing all they can to share information with us um, that they can, that, uh, that they won't get in trouble for sharing with industry based on it. It is policy, and industry um, can assist and provide comments on policy, but we can't develop policy. Um, but we are engaged, and we are having, having meetings to talk about um, all the seeds that are coming out in the future. And uh, last slide. Um, the last slide uh, just talks about the Defense Policy Advisory Committee 
and uh, Chris already touched on that. Um, we're just patiently to see how this is going to turn out. One of the good things, um, based on what he said, is we've been asking and asking and asking to have uh, some type of industry participation, and, and he's saying it happened at the highest level. So we're waiting patiently to see and make sure. Just, just correction on your uh, slide. That's not my committee. <laughs> Hello, uh, Jane Dinkle, Industry. Uh, Quentin, you mentioned a uh, TS accountability ISL that's been distributed for comment, and I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I have not seen that. Can you tell me when that was released for comment, and when are those comments due back by? It was released Thursday July, last week, July and, and the comments, Valerie, can you help me when the comments are due back? I want to say sometime in August, sometime in August. But I, I, I did send it to all of the NISPAC and the MOUs, but if you need it, I can get it. Uh, David Wright, uh, DCSA. Uh, on the deferred population for the adjudications, if you look at the subject uh, within DIS, they have a recent closed investigation and they are enrolled in CE. That's your indicator that that. Uh, that uh, and 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 that's 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 good. Um, but if you could post that on your website to tell us, and and also if if it is posted on the website, just tell us where. But two, remember that only 33% of industry have this account. So most people are using this system all right. Quentin, thank you. And, and we will post it. We'll put it, we'll put it in the VROC call center and the, uh, and the CAF uh, frequently asked questions. Um, and to your point, that's, that's true. But again, we have been asking industry to move to this several months, and so we need the support of your committee to ensure and to um, stress the importance of it. So again, the, the 1 August date is, is to, we've got to start moving forward in transformation and into the new system record where, that will be part of ENVIS. So at, at some point in time, we have to say, you're in or you know, you need to address whatever issues, if there are issues, and we, we know this is hard, change is hard, and not everybody is going to be able to problems encountered. And we want to help with those problems. Heather was very clear. We have a whole team postured to help with those issues. But we really need the support of this committee to stress to industry how important this is. So your help would be very much appreciated. And, and the business rules, can I speak one more thing? The business rules that you um, suggested uh, for the deferrals, that, that's the plan. What we want to do is build, based on the risk um, portfolios of these cases uh, and all the analysis, we want to now update the business rules to address that so it's an automatic thing so we won't be in this kind of... Um, and, and just to, to kind of help you out when it comes to the communication process for, uh, and getting the word out to industry, we, you know, our committees have worked really hard with Heather and, and the B Rock to push the word out. Um, we've, we've had NCMS brown bags. We've we briefed it at NCMS at our, our national committees. We've sent out uh, emails and reminders. And you know, every time you guys post something on your website, we're posting on our we're we're posting it on our website and sending it out to to all of our members. So so we're really doing our our part. But I, I think. Um, Challenge is, is not the system of record. And until more things are put into this that's going to force people to go over and look for information, I, I, I'm not sure if you're going to get the outcome that, that, that you're looking for. I, I know that, that the date is coming up for 1 August, um, and, and hopefully you guys will get a flood of information put into the, you know, a flood of, of new members or new people getting access to the system by the, by the end of the month. But but again, with, with limited things that you can see in this, um, I think that's one of the problems. And also the other problem is how long will it be before this becomes system of record? 
that'll also help with the with the changeover. But but this is something that we've seen in the past when we went from one system to the other. Whenever you have two systems, as long as that old system is system of record, it's just a challenge getting people to move forward. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> First, uh, I, I do want to recognize and thank Quentin for uh, working with you and all your expertise and hope to see you continue in that because I'm, I'm expecting you will. <laughs> um, but uh, I did want to amplify <clears throat> excuse me, on the, uh, the process for uh, becoming a member. It's, it's completely transparent. If you go on our website, uh, look at the bylaws for the NISPAC, and you will see our process for how uh, folks are nominated to become a NISPAC industry member. Uh, so I encourage that. Um, and as a, just in the interest, again, of transparency, uh, one of the slides that Quentin referred to was the NISP and CUI. And yes, we know unprecedented changes um, in the space of uh, unclassified uh, information, particularly on systems. And so I want you to know we are working that. It's, it's early on, but uh, ISOO, uh, DOD, and SA uh, have met. Um, and we will, we will be working on something, and we'll coordinate that with the CSAs. Uh, because I know the oversight assessment part of that is, is a challenge, um, probably for all of us on both sides, it's safe to say. So we're aware of it. We're working it. We know it's a big issue. And uh, hopefully, I would say within the next 30 days, we'll, we will have some guidance out there. I want to say one thing about the, uh, the working groups. As you know, my biggest fear of the NISPAC was it wasn't doing anything. Baiting society, mostly. And so these working groups will really begin to show some, some promise. I mean, the ones I've attended have been very, uh, very good. They've been spirited, but they're actually getting some things done. In fact, I'd like to see more working groups. I'd like to see a working group on Again, this is kind of the ground level to, to be able to get these to work. And Charlie, your group reminds me of a weightlifter. Every time I turn around, you're putting more weight on the... More, more help you, too. Uh, and, and so I see this as a very collaborative effort. It's something that can actually get things done for a change. So, right, it, uh, let's hear from uh, Devin yeah. Casey on uh, CUI, and then we'll take a uh, ten-minute break. Good morning. I'm Devin Casey. I see the CUI. I stand between you and a well-deserved ten-minute break. <laughs> uh, so I'll keep it short, um, but try to hit all the, the main information here. Uh, agencies are still implementing CUI. Uh, that's been the, the, Trump, the card we've been playing for a couple of years now. We have seen significant progress in our annual report uh, where agencies have reported on where they were from last year, and we are currently in the process of drafting a letter and request for this year's annual report to get better information from them and see if they manage to meet or keep to the timelines that they sent us last year. Uh, the most important thing that we got uh, from the reports last year is that most agencies are in the process of policies within the next 6 to 12 months. Uh, and that's the biggest hurdle of the CUI program. It requires that they've done a good analysis of where they are and that they have a plan about where they're going. Uh, after that program, uh, that policy development and publication at agencies, the dominoes tend to fall rather quickly. Uh, you heard from DOD earlier that they are working on their CUI uh, policy as well and that a lot will change once that CUI policy comes out, the program starts to implement, uh, the rest of the years of bureaucracy kick in, and the program really gains, gains a lot of speed. Uh, two big uh, efforts that are going on that industry is probably interested in is, of course, the, uh, the public notice and public comment period for the NIST 800-171 and 800-171-B. Now, the NIST 800-171 Rev 2 has minor kind of quality of life changes. The content has not been way. The controls are the same. The number of controls are the same. How that information is laid out uh, has changed a little bit. So please do feel free to comment. Again, that comment period is open until August 2nd. Now, the NIST 800-171B, which is an attachment being added to the 171 world, uh, includes additional controls to address advanced persistent threats, on contracts or programs that are HVAs or high value assets. Uh, we know that those types of uh, programs, that type of information is being targeted in a way that's more advanced and or different from what the controls 800-171 uh, 
uh, now revision two or soon to be revision two, address, these controls are meant to address those uh, more advanced and slightly different threats that these different types of information face. Uh, so please uh, provide your comments back. The, the period was extended to August 2nd. You can find a blog post on our website. There'll be a new blog post letting you know that the comment period was extended. But how and when to comment and who to send those comments to are provided on the NIST website, and you can get to them. So, uh, we did have an industry day uh, here at these offices where a lot of uh, it was actually kind of geared toward agencies to help meet with industry, where industry is providing solutions for the implementation of CUI. Uh, I was very successful. A lot of the industry participants who, uh, who were there said that they, while it was a smaller group than a lot of the big trade fairs, it was the perfect target audience um, because it was the concerned implementers of the CUI programs at agencies. That was a very successful thing. Uh, the best way to find out about all this is through our website and blog. So we have archives.gov forward slash CUI. Right on the top right is a way to join our blog. You'll get notified about any of these events. Uh, one of the main events that we notify or, or that you can get notified by on our blog is our stakeholder update. So uh, you see that we had one um, that we mentioned that we would have. We've actually had two since then. We just had one yesterday afternoon. Um, it's an online webinar, WebEx, that you call into. Uh, it's for agencies, industry, um, academia, any stakeholders in the CUI program. We, any updates? the program in the first half of the meeting, and then we do questions and answers uh, with anyone who has questions about the CUI program or what's been going on there, so that's been going well. Uh, we will have another one we'll announce on our blog. We'll be posting the slides to our previous one on the blog as well. You'll hear me say blog a lot, so please go to the CUI blog if you want more information about the CUI program. Um, some other things, some things that we mentioned in that briefing that we've talked about that are happening. There's a position description that's out for CUI that agencies can use to hire individuals who are running the program manager position at agencies. Uh, we have a destruction notice that's in its final stage of being worked out that will revise the existing multi-step destruction notice to clarify issues and questions about single-step destruction and the requirements for protection of information prior to its final destruction uh, in a multi-step process. Uh, we also have a new registry committee, uh, which is a working group developed from our advisory council that helps advise our office on changes, updates, and modifications to the CUI registry and helps streamline that process and get uh, better buy-in from the uh, affected parties, the legal offices, and the information security professionals from multiple agencies so that the CUI executive agent can have a, a good recommendation from that group uh, prior to bringing it to the council for final approval. Um, I saved the best two for last. Um, I don't have too much information on the FAR. There's no new status for you. It's still going to come out for public comment sometime this fall. And that's the CUI FAR case. Uh, we have a lot of material that we put online where we've talked about it. It is based off of the DFAR 7012, so it's kind of a more advanced, a newer version of that that will apply to all of the other agencies. It's going through the regular government process. It's not particularly hung up on anything, so it hasn't been intentionally stalled. It's just going through process. And then, again, it'll come out for public comment. If you're not someone like me who reads the Federal Register every morning, you can join our CUI blog and get a <laughs> notification of the, uh, the notices uh, and the public comment period for that FAR. Uh, we are already planning that once the FAR comes out for public comment, we will do a ad hoc stakeholders meeting um, to talk to anyone who wants to understand what we were going for in the FAR, to understand the context of what, why it's in there to help ensure that we get better quality comments back on possible changes to that text. Ad hoc meeting, uh, which we will announce when we announce the public comment period for that far. So encourage and, and, and want best feedback from industry, and we want to make sure that we provide the information to you so you can give us those, those quality comments that help us change that text in a way uh, that's beneficial to, to all parties. Um, and then kind of the next part is, uh, and, it, and it goes in line with the FAR, uh, oversight to industry is something that the CUI program uh, is very focused on. And, and standardization across the executive branch includes those non-federal entities. And it's something that we have a plan for that will really start to take shape after the FAR uh, goes up for public comment and becomes finalized that our office will move out on. But we also have a lot to learn from the people who are already doing DHS or some of the other more mature information security offices 
and we were working with their current efforts and becoming more involved with their current efforts to ensure that they align well with the standardization. It goes very well hand in hand with the goals of the NIST of a shared baseline, a standardized approach that allows for better security uh, with less overhead and less needless uh, administration and o uh, overhead in, in both realms from our side as well as from yours. Uh, so we are, we are working on all of those. Um, some things that we're looking to clarify the relationship between as we move forward and as CUI has its far come out are things like the relationship between CUI and the HVA program and this 800-171B, uh, the CMMC process you might have been hearing about, uh, deliver on compromise, defense and transition are all things that are doing a lot of work and a lot of really good work um, and some work standardization and overseeing the unclassified world. And we're, uh, we're trying to make sure that we're prepared to uh, provide that, that guidance to the executive branch as well as industry and other stakeholders. And how those overlap, why they overlap, where they overlap, um, and, and make sure that everyone's working together on the same page as CUI continues to roll out. Uh, so I'll kind of end on that note. I, haven't, I don't think I've said it yet. We have a website, archives.gov for us, CUI. We have a blog on that website that I haven't mentioned at all throughout this briefing uh, that you can find out a lot more information. Uh, we do proactively engage in a lot of different meetings through NPMS, a lot of the industry groups that are here. If you have more questions about CUI, the website has an email and phone number. Please call or email us uh, or send me an email at devin.casey at Questions for uh, Devin in the auditorium? Thank you. All right, we're going to take a 10-minute break. The restrooms are to your left when you exit. Please be back in 10 minutes. We can wrap this thing up. Okay, we're going to continue on now. I'm going to call Valerie Kerbin to the mic. To give us an update. Can oh, you can, you can do it. You, okay. can, you, can, you, can, you can sit here, too. Yeah. Um, and thank you, some of you, for coming back after the meeting. <laughs> all are interested in SECIA updates. So um, for SECIA, the security executive agent, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a status on where we are in some of the policies, and then I'll talk a little bit about trusted workforce and also cover um, some of the things that came out of our meeting with industry back in so um, as you heard from the last meeting, seed eight, the draft is about temporary eligibility. So this policy will cover some more specifics on your agencies and industry working together on granting temporary eligibility, access to the various levels of collateral clearance, and the process for um, a one-time access, and then also the process for approving people for a higher sensitive position. So this policy will cover specifics, as I said, on um, basically these areas. So the policy has been in play for a little over a year, and I've mentioned before to this forum policy. No, take a while, right, Valerie? <laughs> and um, the point is we did go out to um, our Security Executive Agent Advisory Committee group comments. We've adjudicated those comments, and right now Seed 8 has come back from OMB review. So some of your agencies were targeted at that point to also review it again. So um, it's been out for interagency coordination on and um, we're going to get it back to OMB shortly. And of course, the hopes are kind of high to have this policy signed and implemented before the end of the year. And that's one of those on the forefront. The other one is Seed 9, Whistleblower Protections, Retaliatory Revocation of National Security Eligibility. This is also draft pre-deliberative. We did go out to the Security Executive and Advisory Committee, and departments and agencies have responded with comments. And please know that um, ISU and other CSAs in the room are providing comments on behalf of industry. So um, we'll get those comments back out to the SAC so they see how it's been adjudicated. And we're also trying to get this through to OMB. So 
So again, those are the two policies right now um, in process for coordination. So um, trusted workforce, and we've all heard a tidbit about it today. Um, the trusted workforce is really an effort that is sponsored by the executive agents, the DNI security executive, essentially executive agent, um, with PAC, Performance Accountability Council, and our other PAC principal partners, as well as um, a few of the other departments and agencies. So the executive steering group continues to meet every month and makes decisions on how we're going to move everybody from leadership, the DNI, PDNI, I know um, SECSEF, we're all really committed to moving this reform effort. A lot of things are going on, a lot of different paths, um, and everybody's really has, everybody has a lot of attention to making sure this works. We're all used to the process. Um, for the past 50 years if we've all been working that How we investigate, how we adjudicate, and how we do polygraphs. Um, and we're trying to do things more efficiently. We've also learned from the phase one on how to reduce the inventory and some of those measures and best practices um, we're taking forward as we create the trust. Um, so a lot of things are underway. The biggest thing is the national security um, presidential memo. It's been at the White House for a few months, and we're waiting for it to sign, but that's not stopping what we're doing. We're still making sure work through in these um, tabletop discussions. Um, the PAC PMO is leading some of those efforts with us coordinating it, and we're ensuring we're hearing everybody um, on here from Terry and um, Patricia you know they're working on modernizing everything so it will be process for everything inclusive of the continue eventually kind of um, move away from the traditional periodic reinvestigation um, so I'd like to then talk about the meeting we held in March. Um, the executive agents and PAC hosted the meeting for NISU and our CSAs, um, and we all talked about where we're going on the workforce. We talked about um, and discussed the concerns of industry, and we addressed a lot of the questions that were raised. We did commit to meeting periodically with the NISPAC members. So um, we're going to plan for a future meeting in this fall, and I'll get together with you, Greg, and we'll plan a meet. Figure out where to host it, but it will be again the same group. partners in the whole trusted workforce. Any questions for uh, Valerie in the auditorium? Yep, there's one. Sure thing. Uh, Charlie Sal with industry. Um, I think I heard you say that the for the security executive agent directives, industry input for that should come through the CSAs. Well, the CSAs see the policy and they comment on things that would impact them or raise concerns, but PSAs are the ones who put out a policy for the way things Got it. So there's still not a direct industry input? No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One else for Valerie? Okay. okay. Thank you, Valerie. Appreciate it. Okay. Now we will hear from Daryl Parsons on the uh, update on the NISA working group. Thank you. Um, again, Daryl Parsons with Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I appreciate uh, the invite down. Allegra, who I understand is not here today, uh, voluntold me to come down and uh, <laughs> talk to you all today. Uh, so I appreciate that. 
Um, I'm really struck by the amount of change that's happening within the industrial uh, just what I've seen today. And uh, I just wanted to let you all know, my leadership, so my executive director for operations, uh, and certainly the commission, uh, ask questions about what happens here and what is the impact of and our licensees. And uh, so I'll give you a quick distinction. Uh, you all talk about uh, contractors. Uh, the NRC talks about our licensees. So they pay us versus we, you know, the government paying them. Uh, there's a little bit of a natural tension there between what happens within the NISPAC versus how the NRC views things. Uh, the other thing I would say is that NRC is always looking and trying to better collaborate with uh, parts of the government. I'll point to Department of Energy. Certainly we share the same microphone. Uh, Department of Defense has been uh, a big help for us even in, in the past couple months. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate that. And ICE is always a friendly face to see at the NRC. So, um, Just in the grand scheme of the NRC versus, and, and just for the economies of scale, if you think about the industrial security program as the entire screen, we are probably the size of the period right after facility. <laughs> So I just wanted to give you sort of that sort of um, picture view into uh, how large we really are. Two years ago, I think we gave this presentation. Uh, we said, you know, there was, you know, approximately 10 classified networks that we oversee. And uh, given the state of the nuclear energy uh, economy in the United States right now, uh, it is very depressed. And we are seeing that within the uh, commission as well. We are, uh, so we've cut back on some of these, um, some of our licensees have cut back on their classified networks. So we're approximately half of what we were two years ago. I don't even want to mention the number because you'd probably laugh at me. But um, we do, uh, again, collaborate with Department of Energy on the accreditation of these networks. So, uh, so we have a very good working relationship with some folks down in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, who uh, go out to uh, uh, parts of the, uh, of the uh, desert in New Mexico and look at some of our licensees and, and what they're doing in classified networks. So a lot of these networks are control networks. I won't go into details around them, but we do, uh, we do have a, an accreditation program associated with this. And as a regulator, we don't necessarily want to sign as the approving authority on that. That's another distinction for us. Uh, as a regulator, we don't necessarily see um, there's a condition of risk there. So that's why we collaborate a lot with Department of Energy on these types of networks. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say, am I missing anything here? So there's two areas uh, from the NRC, two offices, one is traditionally NRC going out and getting contracts and having a classified or cleared contractor. The majority of them work for me specifically, but I actually represent the area of the licensees and the classified work that they do. So, um, so there's two sort of offices within the NRC that handle um, contractors or, or the industrial security program. Um, the other thing I would want to say is just mentioning CUI that has come up a lot today. Uh, a week from today, NRC is actually going to have a public meeting on CUI and its impact on our working group for CUI within the agency. So with that, any questions or anything about uh, the way NRC operates versus the way Department of Energy operates. We are separate agencies. Um, you know, please. Thank you. So sir. thank you. I appreciate your time. No, no. Thanks, thanks. thanks for coming. All right, Greg, you have about the clearance working group? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, so being toward the end here, most of what I would discuss has really already been discussed. 
Um, we did have a, uh, a robust discussion at the clearance working group about just about everything we heard today, whether it be the systems, NISS, DISS, uh, NCCS, uh, NID. We talked about the NIDs. We uh, talked about TI, DIT in transition, uh, NISP and CUI. So pretty much every trusted workforce 2.0 seeds. Um, I did mention a couple of points uh, on the one item that I didn't hear today that we talked about in our meeting was the um, level of cyber assurance for that system. Uh, the question came up in our working group, does it meet the moderate level of confidentiality um, given the data is going to eventually be in there or is already in some ways in there? I think it's useful to find out. Um, and uh, so that's the, you know, the baseline for CUI uh, basic information. So uh, I'd ask that uh, DOD take that back to confirm what the, uh, the level of uh, confidentiality and, and integrity and assurance for that system is or is planned to be. Um, so I did also want to mention um, we talked about the implementation for continuous evaluation. Um, so we heard today close to 1.4 million. My understanding is, and Valerie, correct me if I'm wrong, Valerie Kerbin, but December 2021 is the, the target date that everyone, it's a requirement that they will be enrolled in. in so we're, we're marching toward that date, and I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, obviously, we, we also talk about metric data, and of course, that's a good news story, at least in terms of the uh, substantial inventory reduction. Um, obviously, timelines are still a ways to go to bring those timelines down. They're, they're way, way beyond the overall ERPA goals. Uh, so there's, there's quite a bit of work to be done there. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to stop. Um, and if anyone has any questions. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to get into the last, uh, last presenter. Russell Hunter, Bill Hoff, metrics, statistics. Ooh. Ooh. So. <laughs> that wasn't just a dramatic entrance. Uh, <laughs> you see, you said the word metrics as I was trying to walk. That was, that was the problem. Um, so so I, I can make this very brief because it's a good news story. And in fact, uh, as far as the, um, I, I just I have to ask that this not be heralded as metrics or statistics because most of what I have to say is is not that. Um, that having been said, um, we we have uh, a normal workload of uh, industrial statements of reasons to review from the cap. Right now we have 233. That's very squarely in the mid of our normal range between 200 and 250 a month. Um, so that means that we're we're working those within 30 days. Uh, the, the exception, of course, is when we have to go back and get additional information. So that's, that's uh, a thing that will um, continue to be an issue, but as we reform the investigative process, the adjudicative process, um, is our hope that we'll, we'll get more cases that are, to use a, a term the CAP has been using recently, uh, more adjudicated cases. Um, because whether it's CE or, or a, a typical old school investigation, uh, when a Doha gets a case, it's because there is actionable information that that, that file a revocation. In industry, that's uh, a really tiny percentage of the overall population. We're talking about 1.5 percent of the people who apply for or are, are re-evaluated for clearances. About just over a thousand um, denials and revocations a year. Um, but with that said. Uh, we know that the, uh, the workload uh, will be coming as the backlog gets, um, uh, gets addressed um, and are working with the CAF to ensure that that gets done as efficiently as possible. Um, that, uh, the CAF is providing some resources to Doha in the form of uh, some contractors, printers and scanners that will allow us to work more easily within uh, DISS, that will also enable Doha to issue statements of reasons directly uh, without having to send the, uh, our legal review back to the CAF. That's going to save time. Uh, the other
other thing that we're doing, and it's been very successful with the CAF, is working on tiny percentage of cases that involve a mental health evaluation. Uh, the reason that that's worthy of mention, even though it's a tiny number of cases, last week from the independent uh, Doha Appeal Board, which said that the way that we had worked out with the CAF, and I, I have to commend Ned Martino, uh, the, uh, the, the industry division, um, because the appeal board concluded that the uh, mental health evaluations that the CAF had been getting are an admissible document in our proceeding, which means that we can effectively using uh, taxpayer dollars to conduct the most sensitive cases uh, which are the mental health evaluations. So it, it, it seems like a tiny number of cases, but it's important because it's an example of how when we figure out that there's a problem, uh, we've been working together with the CAF and getting it right. The number of cases that Doha has pending is actually right now less than 700. Uh, of those, uh, 383 are active with administrative judges. Um, um, there are 157 cases that are uh, being written up as hearing decisions, and there are four process. So again, we're talking about tiny numbers um, at the end of the process that starts out with hundreds of thousands. That's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, there's one here. Is consideration with EAP being out in place that DOHA and or the CAF can go to the individual directly to get the data and take out the FSO and the middle person? So that's a great question, and that is a very uh, appropriate future-leaning question because uh, one of the challenges um, with dealing with a, an individual whose most sensitive information is being adjudicated is, is the Privacy Act. So um, as you all know, NISPOM 2-202 provides that the FSO will sit down with the individual to prepare the, uh, the application, which means that the FSO or designee Privacy Act information that the individual is closing. You know, back in the really old days, that was done in a sealed envelope. Now, I, I like to say the FSO has become the sealed envelope for Privacy Act purposes. Um, there is a future state, but not now, in which uh, we might be able to go direct to the individual. Certainly, everything that Doha does after the issuance and answer of the state does go directly to the individual. So we are, we are trying, uh, so when, when, when we get a case, uh, we, we maximize uh, going direct to the individual. Having the FSO in the middle is valuable, however, because one of the things we need to assure is that we have jurisdiction. If an individual is not employed by a contractor who requires the individual to have access to classified information um, or needs some other kind of eligibility, like, for example, CAC eligibility, then we do not have jurisdiction to proceed with the, with the case. So it is important for us to be able to reach out to the FSO to at least ensure that the individual is there and is performing the work that they were they were put in for the, the clearance or eligibility in the first. So so that's a great question because it touches on both Privacy Act and jurisdiction, which are two things that uh, we're we're constantly trying to make sure uh, that we're we're getting right uh, because it's, it's it's very important that we we obviously can't give a clearance to somebody uh, just because they want a clearance. Uh, there is one exception, by the way, to that jurisdiction rule, which is if an individual is suspended by the director of the Defense Security Service, which is a very rare instance. We do it in only the most serious cases. When that happens, the individual may, may often lose their job, and at that point they can write in and still seek due process because they've had an action taken against them, but they haven't had the opportunity for due process. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people ask me why the industry process is different. One of the reasons is so um, uh, getting the FSO out of the middle, you know, we, we did that on passports. Um, C4 is a great example of clearance reform where uh, the adjudicative guidelines improved dramatically for the collateral world when we started to do what we knew was the right thing to do uh, for SCI and had been national policy from ODNI and ICPG 704.2 nine years, uh, and FSO stopped becoming passport libraries. So that was a good thing. Um, this is something where I suspect the FSO role will continue for reasons of privacy and uh, eligibility.
can promise my future answers will be shorter. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much. No, not, not at all. Okay, we're going to move into the last segment, which is the open forum. So any, anybody has anything to say about anything, now's your chance. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm Stan Borgia from Rolls-Royce. I'd like to thank you very much for you know, uh, what you do in hosting this. Uh, the only thing I would uh, offer is on the National Interest Determination Waivers, which coincidentally came out this week, I'd like to thank uh, yourself and DSS, uh, Jess Spinegar, Fred Gortler, uh, countless others who've been following this and pushing it through. I know that it's just one small segment of the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 842, and we're very anxious to help you in the, um, in the effort to go forward and address those other parts of the uh, Act with regards to waivers or anything else that, uh, that would help uh, address that. I know that uh, a lot of things have been done with regards to other uh, entities. I know that the Undersecretary has uh, invited the DNI and DOE to uh, join in this, and I think that there are many of us who'd like to be able to help in that. I myself, uh, as a former uh, or retired now FBI Special Agent who also worked at the Department of Energy as the IN1, uh, had a lot of experience in dealing with especially the NTIB countries, and uh, I think uh, I could be able to help. And if you do set up uh, future meetings of your subcommittees on this, I, I would uh, welcome the opportunity to help offer some clarification that would help move some of those issues forward. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. No, not at all. Anyone else? All right. I note it's 1235. We've done actually pretty well. Uh, two last things. Um, <clears throat> the next NISPAC, is, again, this is uh, tentatively because let's pray the government doesn't shut down again. Uh, if we have uh, debt ceilings and uh, budget issues looming here, but if things work, it'll be Wednesday, uh, November 20th here, National Archives. Um, Lastly, uh, if those of you who did not sign in, if you would be kind enough to do that when you leave, we'd appreciate it so we can keep a tally on who was, uh, was here. All right, again, I appreciate you all coming down on such a hot, uh, hot day. Have a safe trip back to where you're coming from. All right. Adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. This conference is now concluded and you may disconnect.